And I'm also University of Manitoba. Um, so today we're gonna do a Let's Talk Teach webinar and along with me is our volunteer Shanae and she will be um, monitoring the chat throughout the session. Um, I'll let Shanae introduce herself as well. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Shanae. So like Mika said, I am a Let's Talk Science volunteer and I'm also a member of the Anthropology Student Association and I'm working in partnership with Let's Talk Science to bring you webinars like this, bring you biological anthropology topics and how important that we are <laughs> and our research is. Um, so we have a few coming up this month um, or one this month and a couple next month. So if you like this one, stay tuned for the other ones. We've got myself, um, beginning of May, and then uh, Dr. Gamble, a faculty member in mid-May. Um, but today we have Josh, and yeah, I'll pass it back to Mika to introduce, uh, go over her rules. All right, so before we get started, I just want to do a quick one acknowledgement. I want to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the regional lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that are made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Um, so just some housekeeping notes. Um, you are welcome to ask any questions you may have. Um, feel free to use our chat function to ask those questions. Um, so as I've said, Shanae will be monitoring our chat for today. Um, do not share any personal information beyond your first name, and this webinar will be recorded. All right, and I'll pass it on to Shanae. All right, so like I said, we've got Josh with us today, and he is a PhD student here at the University of Manitoba, and he's studying Neanderthal teeth. So I thought he would be a really great um, presenter for you guys to talk about the evolution of teeth, and I'll pass it off to Josh. Thanks. Just have to share my screen here. Okay, is that working? Uh, okay, uh, like Shanae said, my name is Josh. I'm gonna be talking about dental anthropology. Uh, there's a lot of different perspectives that we could approach talking about teeth. Uh, so for example, dentists or orthodontists would be coming at it from a totally different perspective than we are here. But in anthropology, our field for looking at teeth is called dental anthropology. And the perspective we're looking at is how teeth evolved and the study of teeth in the archeological record and the fossil record. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. So to start off with, if we're gonna talk about dental anthropology, let's start by defining what anthropology is. Um, anthropology is the study of humans, and this includes human biology and behavior, both in the past and in the present. Uh, this is a really broad topic, obviously, because there's a lot of different ways to talk about humans. Uh, so in North America, universities usually divide anthropology into four subfields. These are physical anthropology, cultural anthropology, archaeology, and linguistics. Physical anthropology today is more often called biological anthropology, but I called it physical because the graphic that I have says physical, uh, but it's probably better to call it biological anthropology. Uh, this studies human bodies and especially human skeletons. Cultural anthropology is also called social anthropology. It studies human behavior and social systems. Archaeology studies both biology and culture of people, but it only studies people in the past. Uh, it's a very common misconception that archaeologists study dinosaurs, but that's not actually true. Archaeologists only study humans, and uh, the people who study dinosaurs are called paleontologists. You guys probably already knew that. Uh, and finally, the fourth subfield is linguistics. That's the study of language. Uh, a lot of the time linguistics is a separate department in universities from the anthropology department, but uh, language is especially important. It's an especially important and unique part of human culture. So that's why most of the time linguistics will uh, be considered uh, the fourth subfield of anthropology. 
So now moving on to dental anthropology specifically, this is the branch of anthropology which studies human teeth. Since human teeth are part of human biology, this means we can consider dental anthropology to be a subfield of biological anthropology, which itself is a subfield of anthropology. Um, but dental anthropology is also what we call interdisciplinary. This means that different disciplines cooperate and work together uh, to study. And it means that dental anthropologists draw information from a lot of different uh, disciplines. So for example, I'm going to talk about three different uh, disciplines in this lecture today as examples. Uh, primatology, this is the study of primates. Primatologists are biologists who study our primate relatives, including their teeth. Uh, and this helps us to understand ourselves and our place in the natural world. Paleoanthropologists are a specialized type of archaeologist who study human evolution through fossils, including fossil teeth. And bioarchaeologists are another type of specialized archaeologist who specialize in human skeletal remains from archaeological sites. Uh, they study bones and teeth to make interpretations about how people lived in the past. And you might notice that there's a lot of overlap between these fields. For example, both paleoanthropologists and bioarchaeologists are types of archaeologists, but they also, also both study human skeletal remains, which makes them both also bioanthropologists. Uh, so this is what we mean by interdisciplinary. All these fields work together and overlap and uh, they cooperate with one another. As an interdisciplinary field, dental anthropology also uses a lot of tools and techniques from other STEM related fields. So in this presentation, we're gonna touch on several other fields, including biology, specifically evolutionary biology, genetics, and a little bit of chemistry as well. And before we move on, uh, one of the reasons uh, teeth are so useful to different types of anthropologists is that they usually decompose very slowly, which means that sometimes they might be the only part of a person that remains long after they die. So in this way, anthropologists differ from other kinds of people who study teeth, like dentists and orthodontists, because while those people study teeth to keep people healthy while they're alive, anthropologists are a lot of the time looking at people's teeth after those people have died. And as you can see here, this presentation includes some images of real human skeletal remains. Uh, sometimes this makes people feel sad or uncomfortable to think about uh, people who have died. Uh, and if you feel like that looking at these images, that's perfectly okay. In anthropology, we try to treat all human remains with the same respect we would have given those people when they were alive, with the understanding that uh, they have knowledge to offer us to help us understand ourselves better and improve the lives of people living today. And so that's why sometimes the work anthropologists do can be a little bit uncomfortable, uh, especially when we have to deal with um, the remains of dead people, uh, but the reason we do it is so that we can uh, improve the lives of people who are alive today. So let's start off going over some uh, interesting facts about teeth, some of which you might know and some of which might be new to you. Uh, just to set a little bit of a background for our evolutionary study of teeth, uh, one of the first things to mention about teeth is what kind of animals have teeth. Uh, only vertebrates have teeth. This might not mean anything to you, but vertebrates are basically animals that have skeletons, uh, which includes most of the animals you're probably thinking of, like fish, reptiles, mammals, and extinct animals like dinosaurs. These all have skeletons and they all have teeth. Uh, but it excludes other types of animals like insects, which do have chewing mouth parts. You can think of like an ant's chewing mandibles, right? They have mouth parts and they can chew, but they don't have teeth. Uh, they have structures that are similar to teeth, but they're not teeth. So when we're talking about teeth, we're talking very specifically about the kinds of mouth parts that belong to animals with skeletons. Uh, related to that, uh, teeth are part of a skeleton, but they're not bones. They're different from bones. Uh, there are some very important differences. One of those is that uh, bones can heal themselves if they break, but teeth can't heal themselves. And that's a really important difference because 
Some of you have probably broken bones. You know, you put a cast on it and then that bone will repair itself. If you break a tooth, that tooth is broken forever. So you have to go to a dentist and get a fake tooth put in, or you get the tooth pulled and then you just don't have a tooth. Like, uh, a lot of you guys probably watch hockey. All the hockey players are missing their front teeth. Your teeth can't repair themselves if they break. And that makes them very different from bones. Another thing that you might not expect is that teeth are also considered part of the digestive system. Um, they are the first step in breaking down the food that you eat. The, uh, when you put the food in your mouth, the first thing that happens is you start digesting that food with your teeth. And so they play an important role in digestion, and uh, therefore they are the first part of the digestive system. And what this means is that uh, since teeth are part of the digestive system and they're so closely related to the types of food we eat, this means that all animals' teeth have evolved very closely to match the diets that they eat. And so we can do some really interesting things looking at animals' teeth and determining what kinds of food their ancestors evolved how to eat, even if we don't know what kind of animal it is. This is how paleontologists and even paleoanthropologists can look at the remains of new animals or new ancient humans that we've discovered and just look at their teeth and figure out what kind of food they ate, even though they're uh, extinct. So let's move on and review the different parts of a tooth. Uh, I went to school a very long time ago. Well, I mean, I'm still in school, but I went to elementary school a long time ago. I learned the parts of a tooth in, I think, grade three. So hopefully you have all uh, also learned the parts of a tooth at some point in your elementary school. Uh, so this should be mostly a review. In general, teeth are divided into two parts. There's the visible part inside your mouth. Let me see if my pen works here. Oh, that didn't work. Nope, it's not working. I don't know. I tested this out earlier. Anyway, the visible part, can you see the cursor? Uh, the part that's inside your mouth is called the crown. Uh, it's used for biting and chewing. And then there's also the internal part, which you can't see, or you shouldn't be able to see, the root, which anchors the tooth into the jawbone. The crown is covered in a dense mineral layer called enamel. Enamel is the hardest um, material in the, in the body. And the roots are made up of another material called dentin, which is very similar to enamel, but it's a little bit softer, but still harder than bone. And both enamel and bone, uh, enamel and dentin are made up of the same material as bone is. They're all made up of uh, calcium crystals and uh, collagen proteins, uh, but the proportions are different. So the enamel has more crystal and then the dentin has medium amount and then the bone has the least amount of crystal. So that's the, it's that calcium crystal that makes them hard. Uh, and that's mainly how they differ is in the proportions of, of the calcium crystal that they're made up of. Um, inside the tooth is a hollow chamber that's full of uh, blood vessels and nerves and that's called the pulp chamber and the root canals. Uh, the blood vessels and nerves are necessary when the tooth is growing initially. Uh, they, the blood feeds the growth of those uh, crystal structures. Uh, and then once you're an adult, they uh, can continue to heal minor cracks on the inside. But if you have a major crack, like I said, teeth can't repair themselves after that. On the outside of the root is another mineralized structure that's very thin called cement or cementum. It is also very similar to bone and dentin, uh, and it just helps to anchor that root into the jawbone. And then finally, people also, they often overlook the gums and jawbones, which are collectively called the periodontium. That means around the tooth. So they're the structures that surround the tooth. They're not parts of the tooth themselves, but the health of your teeth depends on all these components working together. So now let's talk about how teeth evolved now that we know what teeth are and what they look like. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides because the story of how teeth evolved is kind of crazy. Teeth are actually an evolved form of scale that evolved in ancient fish hundreds of millions of years ago. Uh, 
this is before animals evolved to live on the land, but uh, there were lots of animals living in the water. And we know fish evolved before land animals did. So there were fish living in the oceans. Uh, and some of these early fish, they had, fish had scales, but some of them evolved a specialized kind of scale, which we call odontodes or dermal teeth. Dermal teeth means skin teeth. So these are like scales that evolved to be more heavily mineralized than regular scales. And these were external. They were outside on the, the skin on the face of these fishes. And uh, they weren't for eating. They were what are what the scales are uh, in the first place. They're a form of protection. So they were just extra protection on the face of these fishes. Uh, and so these odontos evolved into uh, many different forms. And uh, some fishes alive today still have odontodes, like this uh, sucker fish or uh, pleco fish here, which you might be familiar with as a kind that you can find in uh, aquariums that suck on the glass and they eat the algae. This is a, a particular species of uh, pleco that has dermal teeth. And uh, you can see these whiskers on its face. They're not actually whiskers. They're toothy spines. They're, they're made of the same material as teeth but they're growing on the outside of its face. Uh, and it actually has them all along its fins as well. That's almost like having an armor of teeth on your forearms, which is crazy to think about. Uh, so in some of these early fish, now this is not an early fish. This is a fish that's alive today, but in an ancestral fish, hundreds of millions of years ago, one of these fish that had dermal teeth evolved uh, these dermal teeth to start growing inside its mouth as well as on the outside of its face. And when that happened, the function of them changed. Instead of being for armor, uh, suddenly they were much better at capturing prey because if they had these spines inside their mouth, once the prey got in their mouth, it would get stuck and it wouldn't be able to get out. And so you can imagine this would be a really good evolutionary advantage. So the fish that grew these uh, spiny teeth inside their mouth just caught a lot more prey and survived a lot better. And then they passed this on. And so all the land animals, the land vertebrates that are alive today descend from one of these early fish that grew these spines inside of its mouth. And of course our teeth have evolved a lot since then and they've changed in different animals and all kinds of animals have different kinds of teeth. And uh, in animals like mammals, we've lost all of our scales. Uh, we don't have scales, of course, but we still have the teeth inside of our mouth. There are some animals that are alive where we can see this connection between the scales and the teeth, uh, such as uh, sharks. Uh, you're probably familiar with shark teeth. They grow multiple rows of teeth and uh, they overlap. And of course, when their teeth fall out, the new teeth move into place. Uh, shark scales, if you look at them under a microscope, and sharks do have scales, but they're so fine that when you uh, look with your naked eye, you can't see them. But if you look under a microscope, they look a lot like the teeth inside their mouths. They have a similar shape and they overlap in a similar way. And so shark teeth and shark scales have not changed enough over the millions of years that we can still see the evolutionary connection between these traits in sharks, even though in most other animals, scales and teeth have evolved so much that we can't tell that they share a similar origin. So moving on from early fish, let's talk about what mammal teeth look like. Um, lots of animals alive today, including the sharks from the previous example, have teeth that we call homodont. We refer to their, their teeth as homodont dentition. Uh, homo comes from the ancient Greek word for the same. So this means they have all their teeth are the same. They have only one type of teeth. But in contrast, mammals evolved specialized teeth called heterodont dentition, which means we have different types of teeth. And hopefully you've learned in the past and remember the, the four different types of teeth that we have are incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. All mammals have these types of teeth. Some mammals have lost some of them, so they don't have all four types, but um, most mammals have at least three or four of these types of teeth. And the reason that we have different shaped teeth is that different teeth have different functional roles. Uh, the evolution of this heterodont dentition was really critical to the success of early mammals early in our evolution because specialized teeth have allowed mammals to exploit many new dietary niches and to diversify into dramatically different forms over the past 65 million years, which is when the dinosaurs went extinct. And that's when the mammal, the mammal age took over. 
So this means that we can learn a lot uh, about the kind of diet a mammal had, even an extinct mammal, uh, by studying what its teeth are shaped like. And there's a lot of different technical terms that we can use to describe the specialized dentitions of different types of mammals. And we're only going to go over a small number of those terms here because there are so many and they're very complicated. Uh, but just for an example, an animal like a carnivore, in the first example here, uh, a dog is an example of a carnivore. Uh, carnivores have cecodont teeth. This means that they have blade-like uh, uh, chewing teeth that are arranged in a row like a serrated knife. And you can imagine that a row of uh, serrated blade-like teeth are good for slicing up meat. So uh, the, this is a specialization to a diet that's based almost entirely on meat. In contrast, herbivores don't eat meat, but they need some very fine bladed teeth for slicing up grass and leaves. So a cow or a deer is a good example of a herbivore. Uh, cattle and deer have what we call selenodont teeth. They have these very fine moon-shaped, half moon-shaped crests on their chewing teeth. And uh, the, all these crests align and slice against each other very fine for slicing up um, grass and leaves. Uh, this is uh, Selenodont, uh, comes from the ancient Greek goddess Selena, who is the goddess of the moon, which is where we get the name Selenodont. Uh, and then omnivores, uh, like humans, humans are omnivores. We are not very specialized for one type of food. Dogs are specialized for meat, cattle and deer are specialized for grass. Omnivores are not specialized. They need to eat a wide variety of things. So we have a type of tooth called bunodont. Bunodont molars have round lumpy cusps. They're not great for slicing up raw meat and they're not great for slicing up grass or leaves, but they're very good at doing a lot of different things like chewing nuts or root vegetables uh, or mashing fruit or berries. Uh, there's a lot of different things we can do with bunodont teeth. So we're less specialized, but it means that we can eat a wider variety of foods. And humans have bunodont teeth as well. So this up in the corner here is a bear, which is an omnivore. They eat a lot of different things. Humans have pretty similar diets to bears a lot of the time, actually. So we have pretty similar teeth to bears, at least in uh, the shape of our molars. You can see they're flat and lumpy. And so we call those bunodont cusps. Uh, so if you have, I think you should have a worksheet there. I've got all the questions on the slide here on the worksheet as well. Uh, this is a tooth that was found at an archaeological site. This is actually from a site where I work, and uh, I took this picture of this tooth. Um, using what we know about teeth and diet, archaeologists can look at this tooth and they can determine what kind of animal it came from based on how it's shaped and what we know the diets of different animals are. Uh, so I want you to uh, answer on your worksheets now, uh, what kind of animal do you think this came from? A herbivore, carnivore, or omnivore? And also, uh, what different words could you use to describe this tooth? And uh, I guess I'll wait for a few minutes to give you a moment to add some answers to your page. I don't know if you're, when you've answered your questions, if your teacher uh, wants to offer some suggestions into the chat, or uh, if not, we can just move on whenever we're ready. All right, hopefully you've uh, had time to add some answers. Uh, we'll start moving on here. This tooth uh, does not have a sharp blade for slicing up meats, and it doesn't have fine crisps for grinding up plants either. So 
We can see it's got kind of lumpy cusps on it. So we're going to say that this is a bunodont tooth, which means it probably came from an omnivore. And uh, in fact, this tooth came from a bear. Uh, you can see it's a really big tooth. It came from a certain type of bear called a cave bear, which was uh, a very big bear that used to live during the Ice Age, but it's extinct now. Uh, but bears are omnivores. Uh, like we said in the last example. So uh, they have bunodont teeth, which are good for eating a wide range of foods, but they're not specialized for eating any specific types of foods. So bears eat things like berries and roots and honey and insects and uh, other plants and sometimes small animals as well. So now let's uh, start talking about these uh, specific examples of fields that use um, dental anthropology. Uh, starting with primatology. Sorry, my cat is walking on my desk. Get out of my way, cat. Uh, primatology is a study of human, uh, study of primates. I'm distracted by the cat now. Primatology is the study of primates, uh, which are the order of mammals, which includes monkeys and lemurs and apes, including humans, because humans are apes. And dental anthropologists are interested in studying primates because we can learn a lot about the course of our own evolution by comparing our own biology and behavior to that of our closest relatives. Uh, primates are a very diverse group that, uh, uh, and different primate species have evolved many different dental specializations. Humans as a species of primate are no different. Our teeth have also evolved to match our diet and our behaviors, just like all other mammals. And uh, primates are special amongst mammals though, because we're very sociable. And for this reason, many primate species have dental adaptations that are related not just to diet, but also to communication. So uh, let's look at some examples of primate teeth. Starting in the left corner here, uh, this smiling monkey is a black macaque. His teeth uh, might look familiar to you because he's got these big flat front incisors just like humans have. And uh, many monkeys and apes have incisors like this. We call these types of incisors spatulate incisors because they're shaped like a spatula. And spatulate incisors are an adaptation to eating fruit because they're very good at uh, biting through the tough skin and uh, uh, taking a bite out of fleshy fruit like apples. Uh, in fact, 70% of a black macaque's diet is made up of fruit. So you can see that when you find these big spatulate incisors on a primate, uh, you can imagine that that primate probably evolved to eat uh, some amount of fruit. Moving to the middle, we have uh, a baboon showing off uh, his big fangs here. Very few primates eat meat, but a lot of primates still have these really long canine teeth. Uh, and so these teeth are not only, they're not usually made for hunting and they're not only used for fighting, but they're largely used for communication among primates. Big teeth can communicate a few things, but one of the important things is that because primates are social animals, we get into a lot of conflicts with one another. And if we were to fight every time we got into a conflict, uh, we would always be getting beat up and we'd always be injured. So one of the things you can do is that you have the weapon and then you can make a threat and say, I'm mad at you. I don't want to get into a fight. So check out how big my, my uh, weapons are, right? Check out how big my teeth are. And uh, primates that have big canines like this, if they get mad at each other, they will flash these canines as a threat and try not to fight with them. So it's a, it's a form of communication, uh, which, I mean, humans do the same things, right? We'll make threats about violence when we get angry without intending to actually do violence. Uh, so this is another way that our uh, primate relatives are similar to us. The last picture here, is a lemur jawbone and it has a very unique adaptation. You can see the front teeth on this lemur jawbone are, they've evolved into a configuration known as a tooth comb, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a comb where the teeth are literally teeth. Uh, different lemur species use these tooth combs for different purposes. Some of them use it to scrape sticky sap off of trees, which is a very energy dense food. So it's very useful to be able to eat that kind of food because you get a lot of sugar out of it. 
other types of lemurs literally use it as a comb, uh, grooming themselves and their close friends and family. Most primates groom one another to keep their fur clean and to strengthen social bonds. And humans do the same thing. We uh, comb each other's hair. We go to the hair salon or to the spa. And uh, it's a social event for us as well. And uh, lemurs do the same thing that we do. So uh, let's move on to the second question. Uh, if we think about all these different ways that primates and other mammal teeth have evolved, uh, think about humans now. What have our teeth evolved for? Uh, what purposes uh, have made our teeth evolve into the unique form that our teeth have? And I guess we'll put up uh, a minute or so so you guys can add some answers to your pages. All right, there's a lot of different answers that you could uh, put here. First of all, humans are omnivores, which means we've evolved to eat a very wide variety of foods. So we don't have specialized teeth like carnivores or herbivores, but we do have generalized omnivore molars with bunodont cusps, the round lumpy back teeth for chewing up a wide variety of foods. We also have spatulate incisors like a lot of our uh, monkey and ape relatives do because we've all evolved to eat fruit and most humans still eat a lot of fruit or at least some amount of fruit these days. So our front teeth are evolved for taking bites into fruits and vegetables like that. Uh, but as primates, our teeth have also evolved to serve social functions. Uh, we have complex language as humans, which we talked about on that first slide. Linguistic anthropology is a whole subfield of anthropology and teeth are a really important part of human language, at least spoken human languages. They're not a very important part of uh, sign languages, but uh, human language is very unique. Lots of animals have communication systems, but no other animals have language as complicated as ours is. And our tooth shape is very important for making all of the sounds that we make in all of our different human languages. You uh, have all seen like kids when they lose their two front teeth and they make whistling sounds and they try and say S's. So we need our teeth to be able to pronounce all of our letters properly. Uh, another thing is that we use our teeth for nonverbal communication too, just like other monkeys and apes do. Uh, such as smiling. Smiling is uh, something that we do to communicate that we're happy and uh, teeth are an important part of uh, recognizing a smile. Uh, and other monkeys and apes uh, also smile. Uh, their smiles don't necessarily look exactly like ours do, but they recognize it amongst themselves as a smile. And so uh, teeth are part of that form of uh, nonverbal communication as well. All right, now let's talk about paleoanthropology. Uh, paleoanthropology is the study of human evolution through fossils and archaeological remains. Uh, this is mainly what my focus is since I uh, study Neanderthals. Um, all the remains I'm looking at are fossilized and we have to do archaeology and uh, find these remains and study how they evolved. So basically you would say I'm mainly a paleoanthropologist. Uh, as we said before, since teeth are harder than bone, they can often be the only part of a body that remains after a million years. So especially with things like Neanderthals and older human ancestors, uh, they've been buried for so long, a lot of the time their skeletons are decomposed and teeth are the only thing that's left. So this means that teeth are really important for paleoanthropology. 
So paleoanthropologists use fossils to track evolutionary changes over time and reconstruct the human family tree like pieces in a puzzle, except that most of the pieces are missing and uh, probably won't ever find them. <laughs> So when you think about human evolution, you might think about that picture with the line going from the ape and then getting more upright to the, the human standing upright at the end. Uh, a lot of people think about this when they think about human evolution, but that's actually a really misleading picture. The human family tree isn't a straight line from apes to humans like that. It's actually a really bushy tree with many different branches and a cousin on every branch. And for some reason, all of our human cousins are now extinct and we're the last one that survived which means that when we're reconstructing that family tree, everything we know about all those cousins comes from fossils. So at the root of our family tree is an ancestor called Australopithecus. We see an example of Australopithecus in the middle row here. Australopithecus was a short human-like ape that walked on two feet and lived about 4 million years ago. And uh, humans, the genus Homo, which is the genus of uh, humans, all, all of the different human species belong to that genus. Uh, we evolved from Australopithecus about two and a half million years ago. And you can see an example of an early Homo, Homo habilis on the top row. Um, Homo habilis evolved from Australopithecus about two and a half million years ago. And one of the big changes that happened when they evolved was that their teeth started to get smaller and they continued to get smaller over time. So the, the difference is a little bit subtle, but you can see Australopithecus teeth here in the middle and Homo habilis teeth are just a little bit smaller than Australopithecus. Over time, as humans continue to evolve, our teeth kept getting smaller and smaller. And today our teeth are much smaller than uh, Homo habilis's teeth were even. Uh, but on the other hand, there's another type of uh, hominin relative, not a human, but a, a, a close relative of ours called Paranthropus. And there's an example of Paranthropus on the bo bottom here. Paranthropus also evolved from Australopithecus at about the same time that Homo habilis evolved from Australopithecus, but they traveled the completely opposite evolutionary path. Instead of getting smaller teeth, they evolved much bigger teeth. And you can see how much bigger Paranthropus's teeth were than Australopithecus. And it's not only the teeth, but it's the jaw bones and the chewing muscles as well. You can see how wide the cheekbones are in Paranthropus. That's because your chewing muscles attach on your cheekbones. So they had big teeth and huge chewing muscles. Whereas Homo habilis went the other way. Their jaws got smaller and the teeth got smaller and they continued to get smaller until humans like us evolved. So why did this happen? Why did evolution go in two separate directions when humans evolved? Well, uh, one of the reasons might be because of diet. Again, because teeth are so closely related to diet. Uh, when uh, both these species evolved two and a half million years ago, the climate was changing. This was the beginning of the Ice Age, and uh, there were never ice sheets in Africa where these uh, ancestors are living. Uh, but what happened when uh, the Ice Age started is that Africa started to get a lot drier. So Australopithecus was evolved for eating mostly fruit and things like that, like other apes are living in forests and jungles, but when the, for when the forests started to dry up, they turned into grasslands and all that great high quality fruit was starting to disappear. Uh, the Australopithecus had to uh, adapt to different kinds of food. And uh, one of those branches uh, became humans and we evolved smaller teeth uh, because we evolved bigger brains. And we were able to find higher quality foods. And also we learned how to cook food and process food uh, with digest and we can get more energy with it. But when we cook food and we process it, it makes it softer. We don't need big teeth to chew it. So our teeth evolve to be smaller. It's possible that Paranthropus, on the other hand, evolved to eat just bad quality foods like uh, lots of underground roots and lots of hard nuts that uh, Australopithecus didn't have the teeth to be able to break. And uh, that's why Paranthropus, instead of evolving big brains to find better food, they just evolved big teeth so they could eat worse food. Uh, and it turns out that our strategy, humans, of uh, getting bigger brains to find better quality food worked out better because we're still alive and Paranthropus is now extinct. So now let's uh, move on to a question about paleoanthropology. Uh, 
I've been talking about how I uh, study Neanderthals. You've probably heard of Neanderthals. You might not know too much about them. They're extinct now, but they were our closest relatives. And they're extremely similar to us in almost every way. If you saw a Neanderthal walking around today dressed up in modern clothes, you probably would have no idea that they weren't a modern human. But there are some uh, very small differences. Their teeth were very much the same as ours, but there were some very minor differences, which is what I'm studying. Uh, one of the things is that Neanderthals very often had a trait called tarodontism. Uh, you can see it in these teeth here. On the right, we have a modern human tooth, uh, a molar tooth with two roots. Uh, the Neanderthal tooth, uh, you can see that these roots are connected most of the way up. They only separate right at the base. And so that's what tarodontism is. It's a, it's a long body of the tooth with very short roots at the end of it, in contrast to what most humans alive today have, which are very long roots that are connected close to the crown. Uh, so my question for you is, why do you think that Neanderthals evolved roots like this? This might be a very tough question to answer um, because we haven't been talking about roots very much. We've been talking about mostly the crown surfaces. And this is one of the things about uh, paleoanthropology is that because we can see the crowns sticking out of the jawbones, we've been studying them for a long time, but because the roots are sort of hidden away, we haven't been studying them as much as crowns and we don't know uh, as much about the roots. So uh, this is where you can use some creative thinking and come up with some ideas and see if you can think of any reasons why uh, it might be more advantageous to have your roots connected in your molars instead of separated. And I'll just wait for a few seconds to give you some time to think of some ideas. All right, if you're having trouble thinking of ideas, maybe you've got some good ideas, uh, but if you are having trouble thinking of ideas, that's fine because this is kind of a trick question. The answer is we don't know why Neanderthals had molar teeth like this. And I think that's an important lesson because there's many questions that science has not answered yet. And being able to say we don't know is a very important part of the scientific process. This is especially true in paleoanthropology because as we said, uh, there are so many missing puzzle pieces, so it's going to be very common that there are things that we don't know. But we do know some things, and this is a starting point for us. First of all, we know that some humans living today also have taurodont molars. So it's not only the Neanderthals that had these teeth. They just had them much more often than we do. But some people, uh, you might even have taurodont roots like this, and you might not even know if you've never had an x-ray of your teeth taken. Uh, we also know that in humans alive today, taurodontism runs in families, so this means that it's controlled by genes and it's not environmental, it's not a damage that happens during life, uh, but we still don't know if there's a functional reason for it, if it made their roots stronger or something like that, or maybe it's just random variation because there is just random variation in evolution sometimes. Uh, so these are some of the things I am studying for my research right now is uh, trying to figure out why Neanderthals had roots like this, or if, if we can even figure it out. Now for our last topic, let's talk about bioarchaeology. Bioarchaeology is another subfield of anthropology that relies on teeth. Bioarchaeologists are archaeologists who specialize in studying human skeletons from archaeological sites. They use evidence from human skeletons to make interpretations about what life was like for people in the past. Uh, since teeth don't heal or grow throughout life, unlike bone, they keep a permanent record of events in an individual's life which impacted their teeth. This record can give us clues about their diet, health, and even where people were born and grew up. So you know the saying, uh, you are what you eat. Uh, this saying is literally true in biology because the food you eat is made up of chemicals and those chemicals get incorporated into your body as it grows. 
Uh, since your teeth stop growing at adulthood, this means that the chemical composition of your teeth is made up entirely of the foods that you were eating as a child, which means that your teeth have a chemical record of your childhood growth. Uh, and when we say chemicals, in this case, we're talking about isotopes, which you may have learned about in uh, chemistry. Isotopes are different versions of atoms that have the same chemical properties, but they have different atomic weights. And uh, different isotopes of an element function in the same way, but uh, the ratio of different isotopes reflects the source of those isotopes. And we can use that like a chemical fingerprint. Uh, we can use that to interpret what kinds of foods people were eating as children based on the ratios of these isotopes, the chemical fingerprint of the isotopes in their teeth. So for example, isotopes of nitrogen can tell us what kinds of uh, meat people were eating as children, and isotopes of carbon can tell us what kinds of plants people were eating as children. Isotopes can also tell us about migration. There's an element called strontium, uh, which exists naturally in drinking water, and it behaves chemically the same way that calcium does. And since your bones and teeth are made of calcium, if you're drinking strontium in your drinking water, that strontium is going to get incorporated into your bones and teeth, just like calcium would. But uh, since teeth only record childhood strontium and your bones keep growing throughout your life and repairing themselves, they keep uh, recycling the strontium. So the strontium in your teeth will be the strontium from the drinking water when you were a child, and the strontium in your bones will be the strontium in the drinking water where you were an adult. So if you moved somewhere from your childhood to your adulthood, your teeth and bones would have different strontium fingerprints, and we can use that to make interpretations about where people moved around from in their life long after they've died. Uh, the way that teeth grow and develop also keeps a permanent record of their childhood health. Uh, teeth actually grow in layers, very similar to trees, which is a very interesting thing. Just like trees, you can cut a tooth in half and you can look at those rings inside of a tooth. Uh, in a tooth, of course, they're microscopic layers, uh, but those layers grow one layer every single day. It's a very small microscopic layer, but there's a layer put down every day. So you can actually cut a tooth open and count how many days it took that uh, tooth to grow. But also just like trees, if you go through a period of stress or illness while you're growing, the layers are going to grow smaller, which happens the same as in tree rings, right? Uh, so if we find a tooth with uh, smaller rings, we can use that to interpret that somebody had a period of illness or health. If those, if the period is a long period of like multiple weeks of serious illness, those layers can show up as lines on the surfaces of your teeth as well, uh, which you can see in this image from this uh, person from an archaeological site here. These lines are called linear enamel hypoplasias. And each one of these lines represents a period of, of significant illness uh, during this person's life when they were a child. Uh, you could feel your own teeth and see if you have lines on yours as well. They'll be horizontal lines, not vertical lines. You probably won't have any because we have very good health care these days. So most people don't go through periods of, of severe illness as children that would leave these lines. But we see them very commonly in archaeological sites, which tells us that in the past, uh, health was... Uh, healthcare was much worse and people uh, spent a lot more time being seriously ill as children. So now for our final question, uh, tooth layers can only record disease during childhood because teeth stop growing in adulthood. So they can't tell us about health during adulthood. Uh, but can you think of any other ways uh, that we can use teeth to determine uh, what someone's health was like when they were an adult? Uh, ways that are not related to the, the, the growth rings in teeth, but any other aspects of teeth. So I'll give you a minute to think of some answers. So yes, there are definitely other ways that we can uh, learn about people's health 
uh, from their teeth. Uh, one of the things that we can look for is cavities or caries, which some of you have probably had and you go to the dentist and get that filled. Uh, in the past, uh, lots of people didn't have, lots of societies didn't have the technology to fill cavities. So if uh, someone has a lot of cavities and we can, in their teeth, we can tell something about their diet. They might've been eating sugary foods or grains. Uh, and they might not have had uh, health care to keep their teeth clean the way we do today. Uh, broken teeth also record traumatic events since teeth can't heal themselves. So if you break a tooth, that's a permanent record of an injury that you had during your life. As an example, this skull here is uh, from a Neanderthal named Miguelon. He was found in Spain and he's from about 400,000 years ago. Uh, this guy had some very serious head injuries, so it looks like he might have been in some kind of a fight or some sort of serious trauma uh, when he was alive, but those injuries didn't kill him. That's not how he actually died, because those injuries started to heal. But what happened was, during this traumatic event, one of his teeth broke and it got infected. And it was that infection that archaeologists think killed him. Uh, because if your tooth gets infected and it doesn't get uh, treated with antibiotics and it doesn't uh, clean out that infection, the infection can spread to your bloodstream. Uh, and once you get blood poisoning from a blood infection, that can very quickly lead to death. So even though he survived the trauma, it was the trauma to the tooth which became infected and eventually killed him. And so by looking at his teeth, we can learn a lot about his life and how he died. And so that uh, brings us to the end of the uh, presentation I have for you today. Just to summarize everything, teeth are very important in anthropology in a lot of different ways. They offer clues about a person's or an animal's evolutionary ancestry based on their shape. Uh, they can tell us about their diet and the diet that their ancestors evolved to eat, but also the diet that they were actually eating, which we can determine based on the chemical makeup of their teeth. They can tell us about social behavior, what kind of uh, communication they had. Uh, they can tell us about the health of the individual when they were alive. Based on the isotopes, they might even be able to tell us about the migration history, where they lived and how they moved around when they were alive. And there's even more things that they can tell us, which I just didn't even have time to include in the presentation. So there's a lot that teeth can tell us about uh, people and animals alive today and uh, from the past. So uh, that's the presentation I've got. I guess we have a few more minutes if uh, there's any questions. Yeah, if anyone has any questions about the content or for Josh himself, um, you can ask it out loud to your teacher and your teacher can type it in the chat. Um, so we'll we'll just wait around for a few minutes if I, anyone has any questions. Any other any questions for like maybe the topic or for Josh? Feel free to either type it type it in the chat.
All right, I guess if you guys don't have any other questions or um, feel free to send us an email to at Altias that you have. Um, if ever you have questions after this session, I will be more than happy to forward those questions to Josh. Um, I just want to thank Josh for taking the time today to do the to, to present today to and to talk about teeth and to host a webinar with us today. So, so yeah, thank you for coming today and we hope you guys learned something new. Thanks.